realise what it's getting into. Um, I'm sure Kathy's the same. It's loads of stuff happening really quickly, which is really exciting, but also um, quite overwhelming as well. It's a massive, massive thing that's happening, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, background about me, I am um, uh, um, organised for AV in Newcastle, if I know the voices. Um, part of the save movement up there, um, just doing as much as I can. I'm about to do a PhD in animal rights activism and the relationship with performing arts with it, which I'm really excited about. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't got any credentials to get this role, I just put my hand up to just game, game. So, um, should we go around the room and introduce ourselves and just say your name and hello and maybe why why you came along today, maybe interest or something like that. Should we start this? Yeah. I'm Kathy, I'm a co-founder of Animal Rights Institute and I work on the Animal Rights Institute and I've been six years for that and just doing lots of different things to try and make a difference. So outreach and stalls and leafleting and all sorts of stuff. It's a trend of things for animals. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Jason. Thank you. You did know, you did a massive speech at the, <laughs> the um, strike a couple of days uh, ago. I organised a youth strike. Oh, just, 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 uh, just, uh, just, uh, yeah. just changing the world. Natasha, I'm Jess's mum, and um, AV is not a bit an organiser, I'm being called with the Newcastle group as well. Um, I've been various attendees and it's part of the youth space as well since they started. Um, I'm in the community now, so I'm going to say that. Also, I'm Jessica, the Saturday Cyber, so we're quite excited now that I'm really ready to be launched. So, we've been involved in this and part of the campaign for the Thank you. My name is Anne, and um, I think it's about January time I won't be moving. I think I've seen every piece out in the road, we've been doing a few, and I've spoke to Alex, and I'm a vegetarian at the time. Alex kicked me the <laughs> and, and I went vegan that day, and that was it. I went vegan that day, and I never touched anything since. It's incredible. Yeah. And now you're here. And now I'm here. It's, it, it was for the animals to begin with, but then obviously now it's everything for me. It's a bit of everything, so it's not just for the animals. That's the main thing. I'm an animal lover, but it's a little bit of everything now. It's got bigger fun. I'm Alex, I'm one of the organisers for ABT side. Um, I've been vegan for nearly three years and I just really was quite intrigued by what Animal Rebellion was about so I just thought I'd come along and, and find out some more information and hopefully get more involved. Um, I'm Kerry, we've been vegan about 18 months. Um, not really being involved in anything, felt, felt quite isolated in the, the friends group that we have and Layla's started reaching out, haven't she, and like you, so we came across you on Facebook and said we wanted to come and try and find out how we could get involved with you guys. Yep, yeah, what Kerry said, I'm Layla, and um, I haven't been vegan as long as you have, I? Only a couple of months, different, wasn't it? I went first. She went then. first. Took me to the vegan festival over in Newcastle. Went there, saw some videos. On Left there. today, didn't you? Yeah, said I'm with you. The dairy industry and was just like I had no idea, and everything changed from there. And um, then obviously found out about the cube, and I've done a couple of cubes, and um, hopefully continue on with that. And so oh, and I've got an eleven-year-old son who's the most militant <laughs> vegan you've ever come across <laughs> since I've turned. He turned. <laughs> Very overnight and adamantly, and is now ruling the house with a rod of iron. <laughs> <laughs> That's class. Well, welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming along. There's um, there's a lot to talk about with this, and I'm going to shoot through quite quickly. So, if you have any questions, um, pop your hand up at any point just to pause. 
Um, it's a big question, it's like something that's not related to the slide. Maybe make a note of it and we'll talk about it after a more of a discussion. I don't have all the answers. This is a movement that is a, is a horizontal hierarchy, so it's, we make decisions as a group anyway. So things that we haven't thought about yet, they're always welcome, or things you're like, well, that might not work here in the Teesside or the North East. It's all, the, the power is within our hands, so if you've got any big things, maybe write them down and we can discuss them in the end. So bear with me with this PowerPoint, because these are images, not a slide. So let's see how we go. Okay, so here's some pictures of animals. Great. This is Hero, uh, the Hero Cow. I don't know if you remember, but a a cow in Poland in a slaughterhouse. So this, the farmer said to the workers, "You need to tranquilize this cow before you slaughter it because it is a feisty cow and will not go about in the fight." And the workers, slaughterhouse workers, are like, "No, we do this every day, mate. Don't, don't talk us, don't tell us what we do." This cow escaped the slaughterhouse and swam to an island. Don't we saw that? There's some, there's some videos about this cow swimming, breaking free, swimming to an island where it lived for quite a while. The farmer kept trying to get it back, um, but this cow was super feisty. Um, they eventually, after a, a really long fight of, of trying to get this cow, um, here are the cow. They got they they got her tranquilized and put in a van, and she was actually on the way to a sanctuary. Because, as I'm sure you guys know, when individual stories of animals comes out, the whole public get behind them, an individual. And it was on it was in the news, and people were like this cow shouldn't die. This shouldn't go, this cow shouldn't go to school. Um, um, so she was on her way to a sanctuary and in, in the van she passed away because of the, the tranquilizers and things. Um, so sad, um, but such a telling story about how these animals are not robots, they are beings, individuals that want to live. They resist death, they resist suffering um, and that really inspires animal rebellions out of um, core values. We look at the resistance of these animals and they inspire us to resist the system that oppresses them. So here are the cows. So, it would be nice now just to take a moment of silence um, to remember all the animals who were born into captivity, where they suffer and are killed, to remember how they love and how their families are torn apart, to remember how they resist every day and fight back every day, to remember those who free themselves and those who are liberated. I'm sure if you've done the queue before, when people look at the footage and go, the worker shouldn't do that, they shouldn't kick the animal, they shouldn't shove them down down into the into slaughter like that, they should be kind to the animal. And I usually say, well, they don't really have a choice. This animal wants to escape. The animal isn't just waltzing in the slaughterhouse. It has an individual desire to survive. And it knows in this scenario they're in, they're trapped, everything is unnatural. There's blood, there's screams, there's shouting, there's loud noises. So these workers, they have to oppress, and they have to do it, it's the whole part of the system. So, to remember how they resist, to remember all those big and small on land and sea, as well as those invisible to us in our everyday, and in our soil, in our soils and in our homes, to remember those whose homes and habitats we invade and destroy, and to remember those who live free from human interference and oppression, and the possibility this offers, offers to all others. So just a moment's silence, let's take it to you in your own time.
or shorter. I think it's quite important to do that, just to remind ourselves of, of why we might be here and the power that these animals have. So. 75 billion land animals, all of them individuals, so all of them are here on the cow. All with a desire to survive. I'm sorry about this. Um, I don't think I can get rid of it. Oh, <laughs> I was wrong. I can. So only 30% birds on the planet are wild, 70% are farmed. I'm sure some of you know these facts already. It's not a surprise to you. So this is, we started off with the animals. Now we're going to look at where we can make an impact and what the messaging we and the Anne Rebellion are talking about and why it will be successful. So climate urgency. It's happening right now. We need to act. So there's prolonged droughts are putting pressure on food crops and many animal and plant species. The warming of the planet is already leading to a more extreme climate. I'm sure you're aware of Every year there is, well, this year there's been um, extinctions of certain animals, the last rhinos, things like that as well, insects, things like that. Multiple fires detected by NASA satellites around the Arctic. Obviously we're very aware of Amazon right now. But it's happening all over, not just in the Amazon. Um, Thermal, thermal anomalies, uh, volcanoes and gas flares, all contributing to this melting of the ice caps. And this is where we are graph-wise, it's pretty drastic. 1980s, it shoots up. Our planet is warmer now than at any point in the past 650,000 years. So it's pretty sober and stuff. It's just skyrocketing. And I'll explain how this has happened. Just a caveat, I'm not a scientist, but I have um, done this talk and looked into it. I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of these things as already. So if you see anything you want to chat about, just put your hand up. So this warming is caused by a buildup of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide oxide which trap heat like the glass of a greenhouse. Humans making products of buildings, that contributes to it. Fossil fuels, habitat destruction, deforestation, trees absorb a lot of CO2, burning and releases it into the atmosphere and adds to the global warming. And eating animals is the biggest contributor to land clearing, deforestation. A high meat diet equals a high carbon footprint. I'm sure you've seen that with the whole why are you praying for the Amazon? Why are you eating a bit again? It's contradictory. Greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere for years. And I don't know if you've heard about methane that comes from the bums of cows mainly. It's so much more potent than carbon dioxide is. Arctic ice, there it goes, melting at a very steep rate. And all these are different studies they're all pointing the right, in the same direction, so it's no coincidence. So by 2023, 20, no Arctic ice. That's three years. Three and a half. So we're going to look at positive feedback loops and how is this happening. So it isn't just a slow case of it gets hotter, the ice melts, it gets hotter, the ice melts. It gets hotter, the ice melts, and then because of that, the water gets darker, and then when the temperature rise happens again, or as it's steadily going on, the, it gets quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker, because there's less ice to reflect it back. So, I don't know if you've seen ice cubes in a, um, in a glass. If you put loads of ice cubes in, it stays, the ice cubes stay there for longer, because there's loads of them, it's a thermal mass of ice. But if you put one in, it goes really quickly. Same here-ish. Um, 
where as the temperature rises the ice will melt much quicker at a quicker rate. So climate change is not simply a matter of cause and effect, it's more like a vicious circle. So imagine it just quickening and quickening and quickening and quickening. As ice caps melt it will also impact on polar bears, walruses, some seals and some seabirds, as we've seen in quite a few photos recently. So there's loads of feedback loops happening um, all over. Here are some of them. It's quite ironic that they just spread quite equally across the earth. There's something here too. In the UK temperatures on land have risen by as much as 1%. Uh, coastal sea surface temperatures by roughly 0.7% over the same period. Sea level around the UK has risen by 10 centimetres since 1990. So it is happening here as well. It's not just a abstract idea or far away. And our food crops are being affected as well because of this. Um, these yields are lost 25% apples, carrots, onions, potatoes, big chunk of onions. A lot of growers will have come out of this year with sore heads and not much income. Farms and growers are used to dealing with fluctuations in the weather, but if we have two or three extreme years in a row, it's potential to put growers out of business. So these growers are used to a certain climate, and if they have an off year, they have an off year, but they know the next year they'll be okay, but they've had continuous bad years. So how much the planet warms in the 21st century depends on the decisions we make today. We have until 2030 to stop the climate chaos and cap the temperature rise at 1.5%. The Paris Agreement proposed 2% uh, 2 degrees, sorry. Insects vital for crop pollination and plants are almost twice as likely to lose half their habitat at 2 degrees compared to 1.5 degrees. So the Paris Agreement Although it's good willed, it's not good enough. 99% of corals will be lost with a 2% about 2 degree rise, sorry. But more than 10% have a chance of surviving 1.5. So it's like that advert where it says, if you hit me at 30, I won't be very well with you at 20. I'll be alright. Um, so we need to be a bit more ambitious with the temperature. At the current level of commitments, the world is on course for a disastrous minimum of three degrees. Climate change threatens the world's poorest and most vulnerable, displacing millions of people, climate refugees, the richer countries contribute to the most to the climate change, but the poorest feel the most impact. And we've seen that already. Um, I truly believe this this Brexit settlement can can be reached through climate refugees. It can be this kind of this people from the poorer countries coming in because their governments are stressed, they're being oppressive, creating wars, and they come here. And we'll see a map in a minute that describes the, um, the situation with that. So, how can we do it? What will it look like? Three degrees, massive crop failure, wildfires we've seen already, heat waves we've seen already, floods, droughts, we've seen them all, just more of them. Desertification in Africa, Middle East, 1 billion climate refugees by 2050. That's if we keep going the way we're going. Climate change could end human civilization by 2050. Climate apartheid um, is on its way if we continue the way it's going and we, the people in power do not have the foresight. All sorts of scary stuff. So, the privileged are in the green, at most, at least at risk. The red, the poor countries, are the most at risk from this climate change. So as you can see, Africa um, is really suffering um, in Asia, places like that. And it would explain a lot, wouldn't it, that why the superpowers aren't as bothered, because we're in the green. It won't affect us as much. Um, but there's a good principle here. Better safe than sorry. Always on the safe side. 
Um, the lack of complete certainty is not justification to do nothing. Um, if there is reasonable suspicion of harm and there is scientific uncertainty about cause and effect, then we, we should do it anyway. If, even if there's a, a little bit of doubt, we may as well do it. And as we've just seen, the graphs say another thing altogether. So we may as well do it. Okay. Extinction of species. So there's been five major extinctions. Four caused by CO2, dinosaurs by an astro asteroid. Ast astronaut. <laughs> Mass extinctions involve the loss of at least 75% within the ge geologically short period of time. The destruction of wild habitat for farming, logging and development has resulted in the start of the sixth max mass extinction to occur in the Earth's 4 billion years history. So there's been proof that it's happened before. One of four species are at risk of extinction. Um, that's crazy, that, that freaks me out. So one in four on near extinction or have the risk of in the current rate. And that's how many. So amphibians get the worst of it. Mammals a quarter of it. So wild life populations are plummeting. Habitat destruction is caused by animal farming. There's a clear message here happening already. Hedgehog have dropped by 50% since 2000. I am, um, when I was a teenager, I went to India and there was these people by the streets and there were snakes and they oh, I want to hold this snake. I said, oh yeah, cool. I said, wait, I have the most impressive animal you've ever seen. And he got a hedgehog out. And I was like, it's a hedgehog. I've seen these all the time. But it was rare there. And now they're quite rare here, I don't know if you've seen, but I remember when I was a kid, and it was as recent as that, that I would see hedgehogs all the time crossing the road, and they oh wait, we need to get these hedgehogs out of the road. I never see that, sometimes I see a odd run over hedgehog, but really rare. Um, same with um, collared doves, I remember collared doves are like uh, friends of pigeons. They came back and then suddenly they've dropped off again. So. There's a real, it's really, it's really, it's, it's really clear, even for me, as someone in a green area, how drastic it's happening. The willow tip to 94%. Crazy. Um, and, and another thing I resonate, especially when I used to go on holidays, uh, camping with my family in Europe. Do you remember when the days when I drive down the motorway, uh, your windscreen paint in dead insects? Where are they? What's, what's happened there? It's absolutely very rare. Even on a, a hot summer's day in, in England, I remember just the the windscreen being caked in squish flies. But very, very odd now to see that. Well, you see lots of ants. Yes. And like, you don't, you can never see ants anymore. No, you don't. Yeah. Um, and there's some direct correlations here. One million species threatened with extinction. Uh, we've all heard the bees, bees are on the cusp of dying out. Um, you always knew there was enough bees because you'd spend, you'd have the summer of at least, uh, I would have some at least three stings, another sting. I still run through, run through the maize fields like Theresa May every, every year, and no stings this year. Okay, it's getting worse, sorry guys. I will cheer you up near the end, I promise. Um, so ecosystem change, 75% of the land-based environment, 6% of the marine environment. Over 33% of the world's land surface and nearly 75% of fresh water resources are now devoted to cr crop or livestock production, and a lot of that crop is fed to livestock. A uh, UN report states that a third of plant products eaten and used by humans rely on bee pollination directly or indirectly. So, without the pollinators, 
we wouldn't have all these amazing uh, fruits and vegetables, tea. I can't imagine life without tea. So how are fishing and farming contributing to this? As well as the suffering of billions of animals, which I'm sure many of you hear, me personally, that's why I got into this game, because of the animals. How is this contributing? So, quite recently, there's an Oxford uni, uni study, five years of reviewing the whole scientific literature. So, a massive study. They looked at emissions across the whole product life cycle, including transportation and mitigation. So, a massive study. What they found meat, aquaculture, aquaculture eggs, and dairy use 83% of the world's farmland and contribute to 18 of our calories. Without meat and dairy, global farmland use could be reduced by more than 76%, an area equivalent to US, China, and the EU, and Australia combined, and still feed the world. I get that argument all the time on the streets, I'm sure, but we need to feed people. How are we going to feed people if we don't feed them meat? Well, if we don't feed them meat, we'll definitely feed them. Everyone. A vegan diet is probably, definitely, probably, the single best way to reduce your impact on planet Earth. Not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land and water use. Loads of stuff. So there we go. Greenhouse gas emissions, acidification of water, um, eutrophication and land use. All above that red line are animal products and animals. Below is all the good stuff. The study found transition to a bad based diet. Society would release 3.1 billion hectares of land, release 19% of arable land, reduce GHG greenhouse gases by 6.6 billion tons reforestation if you put reforestation in there it's 71 percent reduction of greenhouse gases it's massive and we can do that because of this we can reforest because land is released it's not land is released then we grow crops land is released and we're growing crops at the same time so there's still loads of space Reduce the certification by 50%, eutrophication by 49%, so there's animal signage and stuff getting into um, like that. So, a, a more thriving water system and more water. And he discovered it, and he was like, I need to preach, I need to do what I preach, so I'm going to be vegan. A wise man. So it's a leading cause of species extinction, habitat destruction, as we've seen in the Amazon, but all over. Uses so much, um, so much water um, and contributes a massive amount to deforestation. 91% of Amazon rainforest destruction. So those fires were legit for, for um, animals and crop for animals. This image is heartbreaking. Is there a rhyme to stop in the digger? World Wildlife Fund say worldwide orangutan population has halved in the past 60 years, while 50% of the animal's natural habitats have been destroyed in the past 20 years. There's a link there. And there it is. All of us and all the animals that we keep, oppress, eat, and all the wild animals. So people will say, well, well, I had this actually with a, a student at the climate strike in Newcastle. She came and said, well, if it was more local, if it was local produce, um, we'd be fine. No. I don't know if you've seen Cowspiracy, but he goes down that route as well. Grazing, regenerative grazing, is just as bad. 
if not worse in a way because if we still maintain the amount that we eat if, we, if someone heart if a regular a regular diet at the moment uh, of a majority of the people so half their meat intake so meat every other day or every third day it would still at this kind of this kind of well a cow being grazed on pasture the methane will go through the roof and it the argument of keeping, of releasing, of keeping things in the soil is opposite actually it would, it would release. And even if it was true and it was the best environment for it, um, you'd still get more, it would still, the stuff coming out of the cows and what they produce uh, would produce more than what they are keeping in, keeping in gases in the soil. So it would still be negative, there wouldn't be a positive. Yeah, so there you go. Um, while grazed on grass-fed animals can boost the locking in of carbon, some locally specific circumstances, that effect is time-limited, reversible, and at the global level, substantially outweighed by the greenhouse gas emissions they generate. <coughs> so, with regenerative grazing, eating animals would only ever be for a luxury for the rich anyway. So when people talk about it, it would be so far from their life anyway that it wouldn't even wouldn't even factor in their lives because it would be so rare and it would be so expensive to maintain. There he is. I'm a big fan of George. He's written an amazing book called Rewilding, and he's he's big about that. About and mentioned before about the land opening up. He's like, we need to rewild that because then that will bring back. I don't know if you saw This Is Not A Drill, that video with Greta and George, and he's saying the best thing you could do, we've got the, we've got the tool to solve it, it's a tree. Um, just plant loads of trees and stop chopping them down for land animals. And we already use enough to, we already produce enough to feed the world. Uh, but we feed it to animals for the wealthy countries. And there's fishing. So, this is a, far, a fish farm. So these fish are kept in very close confinements. Um, so overfishing has led to marine scientists to say that the threat faced by our marine ecosystem is much larger than any other environmental threat by like increasing population. Scientists estimate that over half a million whales, dolphins and seals are killed every year by fishing vessels and that 40 to 50 million sharks are killed by lines and nets. And all these are individuals, again, come back to this message, they're all hero, they are all an individual with a desire, biologically designed to live, biologically designed with pain receptors to avoid death and suffering. Fisher's Oceans by 2048. So it's no longer a fringe issue, I'm sure. I mean, I'm so inspired and encouraged by every day there's an article out on a mainstream news outlet now about veganism, plant-based food system, cutting out meat. I don't know if you saw it, was it yesterday? I think it was today, that lawyer saying they should make meat, eat meat illegal. So cool. Um, and the, uh, um, the lady from Viva, is it Jeanette? Juliet. Juliet, yeah saying how people thought smoking in every place would be uh, was normal and now they look back and go that's so weird and i walk around the metro center my mum used to say i used to follow people on the metro center and wait for them to die the people were smoking um i want the metro center now no one's smoking i remember going back from nightclubs and stinking of smoke but i don't remember the smoking but i just remember this the census and now it's completely out of my brain. And that could be the same for eating meat, hopefully, in animal products. The denial of the impact of animal agriculture and fishing on the climate is tantamount 
to denying climate change. So I'm sure you've seen some signs in the climate strike about saying you can't be an environmentalist and eat meat at the same time. That everything's linked with animals. So the animal emergency, this is where we're coming in. Uh, this is the slaughter. Chickens. Uh, it's insane. Just catapulting to the top there. You know, our chickens slaughtered over 40 years, 50 years. Global meat consumption to rise by 73%. A lot of that's down to um, poorer countries getting richer and want to be like the West. So it's been happening for ages. The warnings have been there for ages. It's not a new thing. What to do about it? There she is. When we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then the hope will come. So we've been inspired by Extinction Rebellion and what they've achieved. So mass participation in non-violent direct action, so civil disobedience. And they've found some real successes. So in April, loads of people were arrested. Five blocks, 11 days, peaceful approach. The UK climate emergency was declared, that was one of their, one of their demands. Got loads of support from celebrities, MPs back then, loads of media coverage. Um, it was all over the world. And a cultural breakthrough as well. People are talking about it now. And that inspired, inspired, inspired Animal Rebellion. So mobilise the mainstream. It's everything's inclusive. And um, there's a lot of science behind it, 3.5% get involved in a movement with civil disobedience, power changes, and it goes in the way of that 3.5%. We don't need 100, we don't even need 50% of people to turn up. 3.5% is enough, history has found. So, sustained and escalating disruption. Um, mass sacrifice. Arrests, but getting arrested recently. Talk about that a bit later. Clear demands and focused on structural change. So no blame or shame of individuals. It's all about nudging power. So this is their demands. Tell the truth about the climate. Act now. Um, must act now to halt biodiversity. So admit it's happening. Call out a um, climate emergency and keep it beyond politics so this isn't a capitalist issue well, it's all linked but this isn't about capitalism should fall or socialism should, whatever it's about government should recognise that this is beyond party politics and set up a citizens, citizens assembly which is a, a collection of the population of the UK to design a way forward and the government, the people in power to follow that. So it's not just Extinction Rebellion that was successful, they were inspired by the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King and his disruptions in the, the bus boycotts and the dining um, at the diners. Gandhi with the salt march and the um, Another protest, the suffragettes, um, obviously the ultimate sacrifice, um, jump in front of a racehorse, um, an anti-slavery movement as well. So throughout history, these successes have been proved through a minority um, rising up, causing this disruption, a non-violent disruption, with non-violent sacrifices as well. Martin Luther King was arrested 29 times. Um, freedom riders breaking the law by riding buses together, so the bus boycotts. Um, 
was saying we must meet violence with non-violence. Martin Luther King described the basics of non-violence, saying that is a way of life for courageous people, seeks to win friendship and understanding, seeks to defeat injustice, not people, holds that suffering can educate and transform, chooses love instead of hate. So instead of being passive, um, addressing this injustice in the face of it. We who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of the tension. We merely bring the surface to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with. It's a really powerful, concise quote there. Um, public opinion. So, do you approve or disapprove of what the Freedom Riders are doing? So this is back in 1961. So not, not a lot of people approved. Do you think sit-ins and lunch counters, freedom buses and other demonstrations by Negroes will hurt or help the Negroes' chances of being integrated in the South? 28%. 57% think it would hurt their cause. They were wrong. It really helped. And this is where we come in. Uh -huh. There we go, I'm a rebellion. So, I'm a rebellion was, um, was born out of the frustration of Extinction Rebellion not talking about animal agriculture. Um, and yeah. One of the big things that I see I'm a rebellion as, a rebellion is like Extinction Rebellion, but it has Solutions. Extinction Rebellion is there to disrupt and to demand. Our Rebellion is there to demand but also provide a solution as well as. So Extinction Rebellion has been so successful because it doesn't, it doesn't follow one demand. It just says, this is what we need. We need to do this to Citizens Assembly and then that will sort, that, the Citizens Assembly will find a way forward. We're saying, yes, do all that but keep animal agriculture bang in the middle of that table in the citizen assembly. So just pushing that a bit further. So it's specifically one or two activists from Extinction Rebellion who were like, how do we how do we address this? And the founder of Extinction Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion pointed them towards Animal Think Tank, which is their speciality of civil disobedience. And through this the sister of Extinction Rebellion. And a rebellion was born. Oh, well, there you go, I just said all that. And it was the opportunity to sift, sift, shift public consciousness around the plant based food system as well as help bring about an end to mass extinction. It was a real big opportunity for us um, to really put our demand on the table. So it's a mass volunteer movement. It's been labelled now the movement of movements because Extinction Rebellion have Animal Rebellion as a sister. They've also got Extinction Rebellion Farmers. There's another group of Extinction Rebellion Farmers. That'll be interesting. But there's, it's a coalition of groups, the movement of movements. Animal Rebellion's message to the public, policymakers, and the future citizens' assembly is that we need to urgently end the industries of animal farming and fishing and transition to a plant based food system in order to avert climate breakdown, mass extinction, and ensure justice for farmed animals. We cannot end the climate emergency without addressing the animal emergency. So that's why I went through all that science because it's so clear that without this, there will be no. Um, solving the climate emergency. There we go, the movement of movements. So, from 7th to the 9th of October, we're going to be in London, blockade in London. We're going to try and mobilise 10,000 animal advocates to join, not just throughout, that means all together, a total of 
So they're not expecting 10,000 activists Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, throughout the two weeks. Um, blocking key sites of animal agriculture and fishing. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, one of them is Smithfield Market, which is a meat market, it's the biggest one in London. And the second one that's just been announced is the Department of Environment um, and Rural Affairs, which is going to be DEFRA, it's called. We will be going for high profile mass arrest actions, force this issue into the public consciousness. There will be plenty of ways to support even if you don't want to be arrested. That's a big emphasis there. There's loads of things and I'll talk about that after the presentation. Mutual benefit of animal justice movement and the environmental movement. We can bring members, bring numbers for XR. So, no other sister movement is as big as Animal Rebellion, for example. Um, I think they were quite surprised by how much we exploded uh, onto the scene. Um, we can take advantage of this huge cultural window to push the narrative of a plant based food system. It's better for us not to. Uh, it's better for us to be there and try and change an narrative than to just sit on our armchairs and complain that we're not including the, the, the argument that we so sorely see. So this all began with um, meet with eighteen animal justice organisations to support, and takes us up to negotiation with government to meet the demands of rebellion and to continue this momentum and that's why London is important but that's in the beginning then it comes back down to local level um, as well so we've already set quite a thriving one up in Newcastle where there's plans to do actions during um, like do outreach in Newcastle during the rebellion to like reflect the messaging but then after that they're going to be doing a lot of um, of their own actions um, decided by themselves. Uh, one voice is a whisper, one action can be ignored, many voices create a shout. There we go. This is our own interpretation. Tell the truth about animal agriculture and fishing, um, act now, so help with the transition to a plant based sustainable food system. I think this will be a massive one for us in October if the government admits, because they're still not admitting it, and still not, still not what they're saying. If they admit this, then it's a massive victory for us. And then say, so, okay, you've admitted it, let's end the industries that do this and help these industries transition. So we are not against the farmers, we want to help the farmers change. I'm sure you've heard the subsidies for meat farmers, for animal farmers, sorry, and for fisher, uh, fisher, fishing, fishing, fishing. Um, it's crazy, like I'm sure I heard Ethan Ed say the other day in a podcast that um, he, he, the farmer loses 30 grand, he gets given 50 grand, no, yeah, so he gets 20 grand. So it's kind of like in subsidies and tax, whatever, things like that. So it's insane the amount of money these farmers get. It's a, it's a dying industry in a lot of senses. Um, so that will be a big part that government should play. And it needs to go to sit in this assembly because it's much bigger than the Conservatives, Labour, the Greens, the Dems. It's much bigger than that. And as we can see, they're absolutely useless at getting stuff done at the moment because they're paralysed by party politics and Brexit. So we've got a few core values. So we treat each other with love and respect. Everyone is welcome in our rebellion as long as you stick to the core values and have the same message. So even if you're vegetarian or you someone eats a lot of meat, whatever, as long as they share those values, they're welcome. Uh, focus on what unites us rather than divides us, be open, uh, that we all have things to learn, 
How does vegan advocacy work in this context? Let conversations about veganism rise organically, defend each other's encampments in the streets, build solidarity and friendship, open this dialogue. So like I mentioned, there is a farmer's extinction rebellion, which we probably wouldn't really agree on a lot of things, but they're there for a reason. So we should respect that. And it comes to also what unites us is this oppressive system. So um, I like to say everyone's vegan at heart. They always, I, everyone has very similar values, but they're oppressed by the system that um, sees animals as products. So they, and everyone's doing it. People eat meat because people eat meat. Most people eat meat because most people eat meat. People see it, so they do it. Um, whereas I'm sure, like I was impressed by that system for 25 years. So having that perspective will help us come together. Principles and values. Anti speciesist movement. So that's bang on the top. The shared vision of change. So I'm really chuffed they kept that in the speciesist point. We set our mission on what is necessary, 3.5% of the population mobilised. We need a regenerative culture, so it's not a top-down thing like I mentioned earlier. Everyone's working together, everyone, everyone has roles, and we work to support each other. We don't follow, um, don't follow individuals and worship them, and, and if they disappoint us, then just close down. We hope we challenge ourselves, our toxic system, like I mentioned a minute ago, it's an oppressive system we live in. There's natural tendencies to revert back to them because that's what we've grown up in. We, we value reflecting and learning, so October might be an absolute flop, um, but we keep going and learn and see where we can improve. We welcome everyone and every part of everyone. We actively Militate against power, breaking down hierarchies of power for more equitable participation amongst all beings. Uh, we avoid blaming and shaming within the movement and outside the movement. We are a non violent network, we are based on autonomy and decentralization. So, yes, it's in London, the big thing, but like I said, we're all our local groups, and that's why I'm here today. It's everywhere. It's it's not just a London-centric thing. It's still in London because that's where the power makers are. But our, we're our own thing as well. So what you can do is attend an NVDA training and be prepared for nonviolent direct action. Join the rebellion. Um, I've just bought a pop-up tank. We throw it down. It pops up. They're on sale in, on eBay at the moment. If you want to know, it's fine. Find the link. I'm going to try and be there for the four or two weeks, but even if that, uh, we've done a big spreadsheet for Newcastle, where people come down for three days, people come down for a day, people come down for a week, just when they can. Get arrested if you fancy it. Um, or support those who do so. Um, a lot of our group are not willing to be arrested, and that's absolutely fine, but they are going down there as well being people to help people. Um, as part of action teams, it's not just people who have been arrested. So let's say there are six people. They tend to work between six and fourteen people who do actions. Let's say there's six people who are willing to be arrested and two people who are who aren't in these groups. Those two people are there to observe, film the action, and also provide food, water if they're there for a long time, and also if they do get arrested, to meet them at their cells. So there's roles for everyone there. Um, quit your job and help us build this revolution. It's such an easy thing to say, isn't it? Quit your, quit your job. I was at this NBJ train in, in London just after the march, and this lady, she'd just gone vegan, and she'd just joined it. She was like, she was a London lady. She was like, look, I don't, I don't want to be here, and I don't want to lose my job, but it's happening right now, and I've got to do it. So like, yeah, fair enough. Like, I, I go through waves of this. I go like, oh, what about my life? But then I'm like, well, what about the planet? <laughs> um, so, when you quit your job, also, 
go on holiday, take a holiday or whatever. It's, it's obviously up to you what you can do. Spread the word, start or join a local group, volunteer to help in other ways. So whether that's locally, I know a lot of people in the Newcastle area can't go down, so they are doing loads of stuff up in Newcastle. Like I said, they're going to do outreach up there. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of a really good group called Nork um, are up there who do loads of really good weekend outreach. So they're gonna they're gonna collaborate with um, another group who do outreach called BV. They do a lot of stuff up there. They just popped up. Um, yeah. There they are, the cows. Yeah, so it's in a couple of weeks. The NVDA train, the non violent Direct Action train, is, will be available once you're down there as well. So even if you uh, didn't get the chance to do it, you want to go down, there will be a hub where you can get trained. This arrest situation as well, if you go, yes, I'm going down, and then you get down there and the person says, right, you're going to glue yourself to the person, a person that you've met and trust in their legal actions. You're going to glue yourself to a massive vegetable and um, sit in the meat market. And you're like, I don't want to do that. They'll go, okay, that's fine. We'll find something else. They won't go, you said you'd be arrested. <laughs> there will be no blaming and shaming. But there might be things, they're all, they're all ranked in, in risk. So five is the highest risk arrest. Um, one is the least. So, for example, if 700 people lie down in the middle of um, Oxford Circus, that would be a one or a two. Because police can't go, you're lying down in one way, so you're getting arrested, but you're not because you're lying down in different ways. So, it's a low risk, a swarm action. Um, if you jump on top of a tube and just stand there, you are more likely to get arrested. Like you saw, I'm sure you saw some people dressed like commuters jumped on top of a DLR train last in April, and they got arrested. Um, so there's there's different things, and you'll be told that in advance. So you might be willing to do big ones, but then not willing to do gluing yourself to stuff. That's all. That's absolutely fine. Um, the numbers are going to be so much bigger now in London from last time as well. I don't know if the, I don't think the police will be able to handle arresting so many people. But you'll be notified of that. So if you come down willing to be arrested and then you get there and you actually know, and vice versa, you might, I'm not sure, but then you get there and you see actually this is a very positive, impactful movement. I do want to contribute to it. Then you are more than, um, you're more than welcome to do so and you will get the right preparation and training as well for that. I think this is it, that's the end of the presentation. Yeah. Um, so that's the presentation. Um, how are we doing for time? Appreciate that was a long presentation. Oh an hour. That was not bad. Is it? <laughs> um, how long are we here till? It's half an hour okay? Um, thank you. Have a couple of minutes just chatting between yourselves and seeing what kind of things you want to talk about because there's a lot of things to talk about there. What I was, what I really want to do is emphasise what this is. Um, this is a spectrum. Outreach on the streets is really important. Individual change is really important. Otherwise, the consumer demands and change. But we are also running out of time, climate-wise, and this is the answer to that. Mass civil disobedience and non-violent action will get us there quicker. But yeah, have a few minutes and I'll eat some of this and have a chat. Thanks, guys. Thank you.